Welcome to Where Nerdy is Cool. And in this episode, which is sponsored by Push Plastic, we have a factory tour of how they make filament in the United States. I received a great email from Josh Van Vliet at Push Plastic, and he said, you know, you ought to come over here and see how we make this stuff. And we hammered out the appropriate date and time to do so. They offered to pick up the flight, hotel, all that stuff, and get me from the ruralness here of Maine all the way down to their plant in Springdale, Arkansas. And so I jumped in a plane and off I went. So what you're gonna see next is this is gonna be the tour that uh, Josh gave me. And you're gonna see the whole process of how they source, process, and well, how we wind up with a finished product just like this. Hey guys, I'm on the road this week. I'm here at the Push Plastic Factory and I'm here with Josh, the plant manager, and I'm gonna let him lead the tour here. So tell me about what you do here at Push Plastic. Yeah. So we make 3D printing filament, uh, it's uh, called a thermoplastic monofilament and uh, it's just simple plastic filament. We make it a, different, a whole bunch of different kinds of materials with different color additives. So um, the process starts with a, with a resin pellet and so we, we melt that resin pellet down and we extrude it into a long thin line running on spools and we ship it off to our customers. It's kind of a Quick way to explain <laughs> what we way. do, yeah. <laughs> okay, and behind us, let's say in the yeah. background, we have a great big gay load of material. We'll yeah. have some video of that here as well. But uh, this is uh, where the filament magic happens. So we go from pellets, and they go into these machines and dyes and the spools and such. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go step by step in great detail. Yeah. So to make 3D printing filament, you start with resin pellets. And in here we have a PLA resin. And it's just little plastic beads. The technical term for them is called a nurdle. So they're little nurdles and they're, they're, they can be round or they can be square, but the whole point of them is that they flow really easily through our hoppers. So they don't get plugged up inside the extruder and uh, they, they just stay constantly flowing so we can keep a nice constant flow rate coming out of the extruder so we get that perfect diameter. Nice. And this here is PLA. We also have uh, ABS, PC, PBT, uh, PCTG, and uh, PETG all running today. Wow, busy line. Yes. <laughs> An important step of the process is making sure that those resin pellets are dry. Uh, while they're out in ambient temperature, uh, sometimes they can pick up condensation out of the air. And these dryers, all have different materials in them. Uh, we tend to use dedicated dryers to prevent cross-contamination from the pellets. Uh, so we have a lot of dryers here and they have uh, uh, desiccant chambers. And so the way they work is that it runs hot air through the pellet and then it takes all the moisture out of that air when it runs it through a desiccant canister. And we can change out that desiccant as much as we need to, but that guarantees we have uh, super dry material that goes into the extruders because if there's any moisture on these pellets at all, uh, that can get mixed into the filament and that moisture can cause what's called hydrolysis, which is where the moisture actually degrades the polymer chains and makes the filament more brittle. And a fun fact about hydrolysis is it's not reversible. So once that filament has been damaged by having water on the pellets uh, and it's been through the extruder and processed, it's done. You have to add a polymerizing agent to fix that. I know a lot of people think they can put it in a filament dryer to fix it, but it's long gone by then. <laughs> so here we're receiving a fresh shipment of PETG. It's one of our most popular materials. A lot of big corporations like to use this for the ease of printability and the durability that it provides. And so we sell a lot of this by the pallet on bulk spools. And this is one of those things that's kind of a little bit controversial in the sense that uh, we buy this from American suppliers, but it's made in South Korea. So it's, it's one of those things where we'd love to have an American supply for every single one of our resins, but sometimes it's just not possible to get certain resins domestically. And we'd like to see that change over time. So we help work with different suppliers and different material formulation people, different companies to, uh, to try to make versions of these materials or or uh, other materials that are even better than these materials that can be made domestically. 
And an example of that is our uh, PCPBT. Uh, that's a material that we're working with the same supplier that we buy this from, but the PCPBT is actually made in America. And so we're hoping that we can try to get the PCPBT in a position to where it already performs superior to PETG, but maybe at some point it could take over. And that's one way, maybe we can't get PETG made in America, but we could even get something that's superior, maybe even close, uh, we can get as close as we can cost-wise to it. And we could have an analog that's actually an improvement for the industry. Okay, so after the resin is, comes out of the desiccated dryers, uh, it comes through a Venturi system that works kind of like a bank machine when you send your, the capsules in the bank. Uh, we have a, a sensor here that reads the level, and when the level gets down below a certain point, it triggers a reload. And so this is what you call a flooded hopper. That means it's always full, and the extruder screw just takes as much as it can all the time, and it just stays full. And that adds to the consistency of it because as long as you keep it full, it's always going to be consistently full. And then you don't have to worry about regulating how much material in particular is dispensed at any given moment. Uh, it's just always full and it's always running. And then we have a color additive right now. So what we're running is our high heat plus tough PLA. So it's a PLA with an impact modifier added to it that drastically increases its impact resistance and its heat resistance. And we're adding a black colorant to it. Uh, it's called carbon black. And so this colorant is coming through this uh, stepper driven feeder screw, dropping down in the hopper at a, at a pretty precise rate to make sure that we get just the right amount of color flooding in with the, the resin pellets. And then this is the extruder. And uh, this is our, our oldest extruder. We call it Old Blue. It's one of our favorites. And uh, you can see it really well. It's not covered like some of our other extruders. But there's a, a barrel here with a screw that pushes and compresses the plastic and mixes it thoroughly and there's heaters that uh, add heat to the process so that it stays to the right viscosity. And so once it's mixed and heated and melted and compressed, it comes out as a solid stream down here at the die. So at the die, you have all this pressure forcing this molten plastic out of just a little bitty hole. With this particular filament, we're taking it down to 1.75 diameter and you can notice on the die there, uh, this is all really hot, but you can see there's little flakes. And those little flakes can be die buildup. And that's one of the things that we work really hard to control because those little flakes can come off and stick to the filament and then later it can jam your 3D printer. And so that's one of those things that's just kind of always present and it's one of those little gremlins that filament extruders are always fighting is die buildup. And this, this particular material is being a little uh, bothersome today, but we're, we're working on tuning it. But straight from the extruder, it goes into this water tank, and this water tank is uh, warm water, it's not cold, and that prevents the filament from uh, uh, snap cooling. Because uh, if it cools down too quickly, you end up with these little things inside of it that are like vacuum voids. And those uh, vacuum voids can act like bubbles, but they're kind of in the inverse because when they get to your uh, hot end, they actually cause a little suction. And they can cause interruptions in your extrusion as you're 3D printing if you have a bunch of vacuum voids inside your material. And uh, some materials are more susceptible to vacuum voids than others. Like uh, ABS is a material that likes to crystallize really quickly. And so I have to be more careful about how we cool that because it's more inclined to get in those voids versus something like a PLA that is pretty easy and pretty uh, steady and it, it cools down a lot more gently. It doesn't crystallize as quick. So you kind of equate it to like uh, warping off a build plate. It is kind of the same mechanic that's causing the vacuum voids. Mm. It's just when you cool everything on the outside and not on the inside, instead of warping off your build plate, you have it creating a vacuum void. Okay. It's the same mechanic. So, uh, so that's why these water tanks are really important and uh, is they're absolutely vital for filament extrusion. And they are full of water, so its first experience is in a nice hot bath. <laughs> so the next stage in the process, uh, since it just came out of a water bath, is we have an air blow off, and we have these little rags here. And that's just to make sure we get all the surface moisture off of the filament. 
and then it goes straight into these puller wheels and these puller wheels are just as important as that extruder so that screw goes at a set rpm and it's very consistent and it keeps a very consistent pressure based on all of our temperature settings and everything and it's all about viscosity so on that end you're trying to make a molten material come out at just the right thickness and then over here you have it being pulled away from the die at just the right speed and so these are super important these have to be in balance and they have to stay balanced throughout the course of the whole extrusion run and that's what our operators do every day is they sit here and make little micro adjustments to either end of the process to make sure that we stay inside our, our uh, tolerances and it works perfect for your 3D printer. So how we know if we're winning or losing is this. Uh, this is our dual axis laser micrometer and uh, it, it measures two ax uh, axes of the, the filament and then it shows up here on the screen and as I told you before this uh, this uh, high heat plus tough material we're running right now has been giving us a little bit of trouble and so you can see the red and the blue are either one of those axes and the green is the average in between and then this yellow value is the uh, ovality which is the difference between those two measurements how oval it is but all this is in metric and so you can see even though it looks like it's really oval we're actually still well within probably 0.03 of what our target is on either axis so accumulatively it's 1.75 on an average even though it might be a little bit less round uh, and it'll still print just fine but we spend a lot of time refining that to try to make it what we call a laser beam where that green line you can't even see it because it's covered by blue and red so we got some more tweaking to do on this line, but that's, that's how that works. Further down, uh, we have our take-up spool. And we do this a little differently than we do than other companies, where a lot of other companies will uh, wind directly off the line onto the finished spool. And we found that a lot of our customers have got uh, really particular quality standards. And so we've come up with a slightly different process to make sure that we satisfy those quality standards. And so we prefer to accumulate everything onto a bulk production reel. And uh, this production reel is uh, what we call production filament. We don't sell this directly to customers. Instead, we take it for the next step of our process. So I also want to show you this, uh, this new experimental thing we're working on. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from customers that uh, are doing things with color. A lot of, or several customers are printing with uh, large prints and they're like backlighting them or we got a bunch of people that use our colors for Keen Forge and they care about things like transmission distance. And transmission distance is determined by color loading. And I mentioned previously how our color is controlled and uh, so we wanna know how well is that control happening. And so we've been doing a lot of research and looking around and we found this nice little color sensor and so basically what it does is it sits here and stares at our filament similarly to how our laser micrometers stare at our filament. And it tells us if there's any changes happening to that filament. So once we get the, the color load fully saturated, we can train this little sensor and it sits there and watches it and tells us if anything changes, whether the, the color mix isn't rich enough or if something fails with the color mix or it's just not keeping up. Uh, it'll notify us by giving us a little little alarm. And so uh, we're, this is still in beta. We haven't put this out on everything because it's one of those things we're kind of on the fence about a little bit because, you know, color is kind of easy to do, but we also want to be able to quantify that we're doing a good job for our customers. So we decided that we're going to go ahead and install these at some point or some version of this so that we can really confirm that we're giving our customers the best possible quality, the best possible colored filament that'll be very repeatable in systems like QForge and uh, for those commercial customers that are making things that will be backlit and they'll know that it'll always glow at the same rate, use the same LED pack or whatever it is and it'll be really repeatable at scale for them. So we're really excited about this and we look forward to seeing how it works out in our, in our, in our whole system. And so here's the next stage of our process. So we take those bulk spools and we load them onto our proprietary winding machines and we run them through a secondary laser check. And this is a single axis laser micrometer. 
But this is a very vital, and all of the operators of this equipment are trained on our quality policies. And so they know what to do if they encounter uh, bad color, uh, inconsistent diameters, or anything that might have happened, like dye buildup over here. And so what's really cool about these machines is if it catches a dye buildup or something like that, it literally stops the machine. And if the operator's over working on that machine, it waits for them. And so now they're able to come over here and they can take a look at this and they can figure out exactly what made it stop. They can check all the quality issues. And if it's salvageable, we can use it. We might cut it and send this over for reprocessing or maybe it was a false alarm because it was a piece of lint or something. But regardless, we have all the time we need to make sure the customer gets the best possible product. And that's the whole po point of this room and this process is to make sure that every single bit of this filament is looked at and it made sure that it's printable end to end on even one of these big 10K spools. So another thing we do that sets us apart from our competitors is since we already have bulk spools, we can have a bunch of filament ready to go in a variety of lengths without even having cut them yet. So like for example, this is a 12 kilogram quantity of our gold PLA. And this could be ready for somebody who orders 12 1Ks or it could be ready for a 10K. And we could have it real quick because we just have to take it and wind it and cut it down and ship it to the customer versus having to go to all the trouble of extruding it or taking up a whole lot of warehouse space trying to have a 10K available that may or may not sell. Uh, it doesn't, you know, and so since we don't have so much invested in storing a filament of all these different cuts, uh, that gives us more money to work with in general as a business, and that gives us money to work with to pass savings on to our customers. And it also gives us just a high degree of flexibility, and that's part of what keeps us competitive. So even though we do like to keep as much filament as possible on those bulk reels for flexibility, we do cut some filaments ready to ship, and a lot of these are our top movers, things that move real quick. And it's just more convenient. You order off our website, we're able to just come grab it, throw it in a vac pack and ship it straight to you. And we don't have to worry about uh, set, setting aside time on the winding machines for some of these. And uh, all this is kept inside a special room that we built that is sealed up with weather stripping and it has uh, humidity control. And it's also uh, climate controlled. Um, so everything in here is, is nice and dry. And uh, so all the filaments kept safe and that's why it's not all vac sealed. Uh, because we found that if we go ahead and vac pack things and put it on the shelf, you can experience a lot of vac loss. So we like to wait until we take it out of this room to vac seal it and then send it to the customers where that bag does its best work and we don't have to waste a lot of plastic cutting and rebagging things because it lost uh, its uh, vac seal over time. Yeah, so here's our uh, packing and shipping station. Uh, when we get our filament together, um, when we make it over in the winding area, it has a white label on it. Uh, we don't put any branding until it gets to the shipping step, and then we add a ship, uh, branding label. Uh, this way we can help support anybody who wants to resell filament under their own brand. Uh, we can do that for them. But here we, uh, we pull the orders out of the stock room, uh, and uh, it's not vac sealed. So it's just here ready to go, and then we run them through our vac sealers so that they're nice and, and, and tight and, and sealed up and ready to ship. And then we box them and send them off the dock uh, to all of our customers all over the world. I hope you enjoyed the factory tour. If you have questions, throw them in the comment section down below. If I can't answer them, I'm certain someone from Push Plastic will. And remember, they're also a USA company, so they support what they sell. So if you have any questions about their materials, you can contact them and they're gonna respond right away. You're not gonna be waiting for weeks for a response. That's the beauty of buying from a US company. Also, they have shared a coupon code, so if you wanna try out their stuff, go to their website and use the coupon code where nerdy is cool 15 and that will save you 15%. If you wanna know what I'm working on for next time, check out my social media. I'm on Instagram, I'm on X, I'm on Facebook, and of course, here on YouTube. That's it for this time. Remember, like I always say, please print safe.